<laughs> we could play a game of like our, which John is not wearing pants right now. <laughs> nice. Neither of us are. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. This is episode 227 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny, and we've got just a little bit of news to run through. And that's because last week I forgot to report that the Kentucky Distillers Association came out with a new press release that was pretty impactful. And that's that they are announcing that there are now two barrels for every Kentuckian aging in Kentucky. Last year, by filling more than 2.1 million barrels of bourbon and aging 9.1 million total barrels of spirits, that is now the record of the highest inventory in the past 52 years that has been kept by the KDA. And this is the first time since 1967 that distillers have filled more than 2 million barrels of bourbon. Bourbon production has skyrocketed more than 350% since the turn of the century, triggering a $2.3 billion building boom, expanding production and warehouse capabilities, and growing the tourism experience that you have seen that is now significantly boosting Kentucky's tourism profile. But distilling still remains one of the highest tax of all 532 industries in the state, and distillers this year are paying a record $25 million in barrel taxes, which they say is discriminatory tax that is going to hamper growth and investment. You can read more about taxes and its impact, even more with tariffs and safety and responsibility, with the links to the press release in our show notes. After winning the 2019 World Series last month, Washington Nationals first baseman Ryan Zimmerman decided to celebrate with his favorite drink. Of course, you know it, bourbon. He had a group of friends that spent the weekend in Kentucky choosing their own personal selection of Woodford Reserve. Zimmerman said he planned to celebrate the World Series by gifting a bottle of Woodford Reserve of his personal selection to all of his teammates and also is going to give them to his friends as well as other people that came to Kentucky and also for other wedding gifts down the future. You can check out Woodford Reserve's social media for the pictures from his visit where he got to hang out with, who's been on the show before, assistant master distiller Elizabeth McCall. Heaven Hill has unveiled a $17.5 million expansion at the Bourbon Heritage Center in Bardstown, and this now includes new tasting rooms, interactive experiences, and much more. The expansion, which is only phase one of a multi-year, multi-million dollar project, is marked by three new tasting rooms, the Fitzgerald Room, the Library, and the Founders Room, all which look out on the Kentucky countryside. There are now two exhibits featuring the story of the man that the distillery credits as the father of bourbon, Elijah Craig, and the Larceny exhibit where you can learn more about John E. Fitzgerald. Lastly, guests can get more immersed themselves by doing an all-new You Do Bourbon experience, and this allows you to be a quality control agent at Heaven Hill, where you get to look at bourbon in the microscope, learn how to nose and taste bourbon, and bottle and label your own bourbon to take home. But there's still more to come as they just added a rooftop restaurant and bar that overlooks all the barrel warehouses. You can plan your trip now by booking your experience at heavenhill.com. This past weekend, Ryan and Fred were invited to MC the auction at the Bourbon Crusaders Barrel Through Hunger event. This is an annual event where the incredible single barrels and other older bottles get offered up for charity. And there's a few special barrels that went up this year for auction. First is a nine-year Willet that went for $55,000. Next is the oldest private selection of Four Roses Bourbon ever that went for $65,000. And a very unique single barrel of E.H. Taylor that we have know if you've been around here long enough, you've never seen any more. It's only happened a few times on rare occasion, but that went for $75,000. There are a few more barrels overall as well as other bottles, but this event in total raised $375,000 for God's Pantry and Dare to Care Food Banks. This event happens in Louisville every year, so be on the lookout to purchase your tickets when 2020 rolls around. Now for today's show, we've had the Johns of Smooth Ambler on, and you can catch those episodes back on 79 and 104, or you can go to bourbonpursuit.com, sort by distillery, and click on Smooth Ambler. We love having these guys on because they're fun, lighthearted, and very transparent on how they operate definitely what we would call role models of the bourbon whiskey industry. Now here's a quick message from Joe over Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Jar. Hi, this is Joe Beatrice from Barrel Craft Spirits. Tasting whiskey straight from the barrel was truly a life-changing moment for me. 
In 2013, I launched Barrelcraft Spirits so everyone could have the experience of tasting whiskey at cast strength. Lift your spirits with Barrel Bourbon. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. If you've been watching my YouTube channel, you know about my Pappy versus the Field series. Well, I want to take that a little step further. What I'm doing is, is I'm tasting these whiskeys blind up against Pappy Van Winkle, which is largely heralded by many to be an incredible, iconic bourbon that people spend bukus of money on. I have this belief that what you taste one day, you may not taste the next day. And that belief was proven true in the first two episodes of Pappy versus the Field. And one week I picked uh, Pappy Van Winkle to be my favorite out of the flight, which had some heavy hitters in there like Old Forester Birthday Bourbon. And then the next week I picked Pappy Van Winkle to be dead last. Now, the week that I picked it dead last, it's worth noting that I did come off a vacation. I had been traveling a lot and I wasn't really consuming a lot of bourbon. So my palate was, I would say, more was fresher, cleaner, less um, hardened by, you know, bourbon tastings and and days previous than the first time I had tasted the field. And so you have one piece of evidence that you do indeed taste differently every single day. And then in my comment section, a, a geneticist wrote me and said, you're absolutely right in that your taste buds are like fingerprints. So everybody has different taste buds, and I find this whole concept fascinating. Now, it's worth pointing out that for years I have written reviews, and I have stated that I believe that you really shouldn't, you you shouldn't give a score unless you've tasted it three times, and that way you can really make sure and confirm those tasting notes. I've gotten busier, and it's more difficult to taste things three times. And so you don't see as many scores from me as you have in years past. But I want everybody to do this experiment on their own. Find a bottle of bourbon that you really enjoy and you you taste frequently. And I want you to taste it on three different days and three different weeks. And just jot down your notes. Tell me what you're feeling, what you're tasting, etc., etc. I think what we might find here is we might find one of the great puzzles in not just bourbon, but really everything. Why is it one day you want a hamburger and the next day you want a taco? Why is it some days I think the Big Mac is the most beautiful, delicious thing in the entire world, and there are other times that it makes me want to hurl? You know, so I think we, and as, as humans, we have this incredible fluctuation of what we want on a, on a constant basis, and I want to nail it down for us in bourbon. I want to find out what days that I like certain bourbons and what days I do not. And so this, this experiment begins, and I hope you will join me on this journey. So that's this week's Above the Char. If you want to follow me on this journey, make sure you're subscribing to my YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search Fred Minnick. And if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Just look for Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny here talking to some of the guests that we've actually had on the show before, but we're here wanting to get an update to kind of see what's been happening because the last time we talked to the Johns of Smooth Ambler, we were kind of talking before this show started and I was looking back and you know we talked to John Little. It was back on episode 79 before we started even hitting that, that three-digit count back in uh, December of 2016. And we talked to John Foster back uh, for a few minutes. It was sort of a, uh, a series of interviews that were taking place at Whiskey Live that were in Louisville uh, back in July of 2017. That's when that one was released. So, you know, coming here today is really an opportunity for us to kind of get an idea of like, what's what's new? What's happening? What's been changing? Uh, you know, they got bought out. Are they driving Porsches and Maseratis everywhere nowadays, right? So it's 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 going to be interesting to kind of see like what the influx of capital and everything like that is really doing. Um, we we've known for a while that the, the MGP days of of the, the old Scout brand had been uh, dwindling down, and now they're revamping as something new. And so we'll kind of get an idea of like what the difference is and where the go forward mentality is. So we've got a lot of fun questions and a lot of good catch up to kind of see. 
what's been going on with with Smooth Ambler out on the West Virginia side of the side of the nation over here. So I'm happy to welcome back on the show. We've got both of the Johns here. So John Little, the CEO and head distiller, and John Foster, the national director of sales and marketing. Fellas, welcome back. Thanks for having us, man. It's good to be back. Yeah, glad to be back. A lot of changes from your end too since uh, the last time we spoke. Oh, you know it. I mean, it's it's been crazy. It's uh, it's it's finally. I think it's like finally happening. Uh, people start taking podcasts a little more seriously. So it's like I feel yeah. like I feel like we finally made it at this point. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to seem like I'm kissing up here, but people take good podcasts seriously. There you go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but you guys also you do something fun as well. Uh, you guys do uh, your own kind of like video series that you post on Facebook and uh, and YouTube. You want to talk about that one a little bit? Yeah, that kind of started as um, it was really a couple of things. It was it was uh, the idea of sort of talking to talking to people and talking to customers the way that John and I sort of normally uh, shuck and jive when we're together, and to talk about um, let people have a little insight into our brand and what we're about and and our personalities. And kind of do something different, you know, it's like, what, what, what can we do that other people maybe are, are not doing or maybe, maybe won't do, which is, you know, put themselves out there and answer these silly questions about, you know, what, what would you rather be a ninja or a pirate or, you know, what's the proper way of installing a roll of toilet paper? And uh, you know, we've, been have, we've been having a lot of fun with it. It's gotten a huge, uh, a huge reaction. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll get around to talking about whiskey eventually, but, uh, you 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 guys are doing a pretty good job of that already, and we thought you know that 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 end of the spectrum is covered. So let's let's answer the real hard pressing questions. Yeah, like would you rather fight a, a horse sized duck or a a, a duck sized horse? Right. Exactly. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Th- things that are really going to be important. Those are the topics we want to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> you know, here around the distillery, like that that dumb shit comes up all the time. You know. Uh, John and I walk in the bathroom, the toilet paper is installed incorrectly. And so we have to have a big company meeting and review the proper way to install the toilet paper or, you know, like just that kind of stuff comes up here all the time. And we just thought it would be a little, a little slice of that. And it, it, that'll keep going and just keep getting better. It, it reminds me of just like, uh, like Seinfeld a little bit. You know, you're, you're trying to find just like the, the humor in everyday life that you deal with and try to make a make it a, like the really the big topic of what it is yeah well you know the most recent one that we did uh involved <laughs> involved quite a bit of bad language uh that was bleeped out and uh, of course we we passed it through uh through our legal department and let them look at it and at that point i realized that it really didn't matter to me whether they allowed us to do it or not i was just satisfied that me and john had forced this million dollar you know, thousand dollar an hour legal team to sit out and watch, sit out and have to watch this thing and analyze it. We're like, just that alone is worth the price of admission. <laughs> I mean, I, that's that's awesome because uh, we don't have a legal team here. We just we basically sit there and we record and we're like, all right, is this going to piss anybody off? Because if <laughs> yeah, not, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, we we understand. There were enough podcasts discussing, but you know what makes what makes the uh, at least in my opinion, what makes a a video interesting in the in our world is is not necessarily the discussion about the whiskey. It's the discussion. It's the story that makes it interesting, right? Um, I think you can do a review of whiskey in a fairly short thing, and it's and it's an add on, right? But the stories are what I I really enjoy. Whatever that is, whether it's a personal struggle or finding some history about uh, you know how uh, how a brand came to be, or or uh, or some history about uh, how the whiskey came to be, and so. That, that's really what we did. And we felt like there was enough of that out there. And of course it was hard for, you know, for guys like us to have our own brand and to talk about just us all the time. But we decided just to do something that was a little entertaining, right? That was not so much, so, so stiff and so much about the whiskey. Uh, and there's plenty of people already doing the story. So, uh, you know, like, like you guys, so we thought we would just do something a little bit funny. That was kind of a break from the norm and let people see inside about the silly stuff that we talk about here at work. Yeah, I mean it's a good way to do it. The tagline of that is serious whiskey made by mostly serious people. <laughs> like that. You know, we're we take our business very seriously. We take the quality of what we put in the bottle very, very seriously. We take it very seriously that that uh that hopefully people enjoy what we do, but we sure as hell don't take ourselves too seriously. 
Well, that's good. I mean, because really what this is all about, you know, the idea of when we started this podcast too, was to, was to really bring the personalities behind the brands. And, and that's something that you all have been doing for a long time because you've got, you know, of course you've got dedicated Facebook groups that are all about smooth ambler and you come on there and you'll talk exactly. I mean, you, you make, you have fun with the community, right? The community that's built around yeah. it. Um, and you're also very transparent in what you do. Uh, whether that's somebody that says something on one other form, you know, I know I've seen John in there and he'll go and he'll correct them or anything like that and be like, no, this is exactly what's happening. Right. And so what you're doing is, is providing a good value to the customer base. And not only that is we, we think of a customer base, we think of like what the Facebook groups really are. And that's like, that's like the one percenters of bourbon, right? Let's be sure. real. Yeah. It's right. Thing we sure. Do. Sure. It's an important one percent, but you're right. There's, for everybody that knows me and John and you and and uh, and knows every little thing about whatever we put in a bottle, there's a bunch of people that don't know any of that stuff, and it's just a delicious whiskey that they like. Mm-hmm. So let's let's kind of talk about the whiskey and the brand and kind of what's been happening in the past like two years um, because we've had a, a few different releases. There was uh, some drainage of the MGP stock. So kind of talk about really like where with the, the timeline of what's been happening here in the past few years. Well, we've been making whiskey for a long time and, and we started sourcing Old Scout in 2011. And, you know, we, we never dreamed that the amount of whiskey that we owned was something that we could actually sell. I mean, to be quite honest with you, when we first started sourcing whiskey, it was, I was, I think the most we ever had at one time was about 3,800 barrels. And I never imagined that we could sell 3,800 barrels. Turns out it was uh, easier than we thought. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it happened quicker than we ever imagined. Do you do you remember the cost that you paid for for those MGP barrels when you first started? Yeah, they were I mean I think you, we had barrels as low as maybe you know $650 as high as we, we paid a lot of money for them but even back then they were 950 bucks. It's probably a $900 average or something I think uh I think I worked that out one time for Fred Minnick on a on a story. Um, I think it was about 900 bucks was the average. Some higher prices than that too. But the crazy, crazy, ridiculously low prices given what the prices of barrels go for now. And, and that's, a, that's another subject. I once had an offer to buy 10,000 barrels and turned them down. The most costly mistake that we ever made, that I ever made, and cost all of us a lot of money in hindsight. Th- thankfully, my business partners only laugh about it and don't feel bad about it. <laughs> pretty lucky about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what we, we all kind of see like the MGP price list nowadays and yeah, you can't even get any age stock and the stuff that they do have. That's only just a, a couple years old. It's outrageous. And so it's, it's, I, it's very, very hard. I think for a lot of people to, to look at sourcing today is like the main part of their business too. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're right. And it, and it has crazy. We're, we feel fortunate that years ago, so our business was cr- climbing, you know, like this, and we were buying like this, right? It was, it was, it was climbing exponentially and we were buying at a much, at a much smaller pace. And, and that, that really came to hurt us, right? We, we, and we felt, thought we had some deals throughout the years to acquire more barrels once the market got, got hotter and the, all those things kind of fell through. And, and so really what happened is in about 2000, we were, that's why we never really slowed the pace that much. We, we kind of went from, it was, it was like two steps. We went from wide open to, okay, maybe we'll slow it down a little bit to we just cut it off. Uh, and the reality of it is that we never, could, we just never found that, that stop. So in, in about 2016, we pretty much stopped selling all of the old scout, whether it was old scout, everybody calls seven, but we never called it by that. We just called it old scout bourbon. Then we had old scout 10 and then we had uh, old scout rye and pretty much all of them just stopped. Um, and then we transitioned to some whiskey that we had for a while, which is the Old Scout American whiskey. And so the, in terms of Old Scout, right, we've had a bunch of things, right? Old Scout was never intended to do, to do what it has done. When we first bought the barrels, we, were, we had bought the whiskey thinking that it was like antique shopping for whiskey. So we would go out and find some really cool barrels, you know, very similar to kind of what, what you guys have done with this thing, right? You go out and find a barrel here and a barrel here. We were going to do it on a larger scale, but the idea was to buy 40 here and 50 here and 80 there and 100 here. And that's kind of how we were going to go to market. And what happened is that it just, it was really well received. And so we were trying to take advantage of a situation that we had fallen into almost. And, and that's kind of what, what started the, the, the part of the old scout. 
now we're in a position that so about that that was in 2011 was when we first started doing the started selling old scout and of course we stopped selling in 16 so in about 14 we started buying whiskey at new make new make contracts and we would buy it whenever we could afford it uh, and then over the years we've gotten some more steady purchases and then of course with the Pernod transaction we've entered into larger new make contracts as well as growing our own plant so that's why old scout is being reintroduced is because in 14 we bought we we bought old scout products as new make right? so we're, the, the products that we're buying are not spot purchase we, we we differentiate between a new make contract and product that's already on the market so you either have new make deals or you have spot purchase and th- those are not spot purchase these are products that we bought under contract as new make Okay. So it's the progress is happening, right? It's there. So where do you kind of see the, um, I guess the, the tipping point of, of when you're going to start bringing in some of your new make, because I, I think that you had been doing that with um, big level and some other ones, you were, you were kind of introducing your own stuff, weren't you not in contradiction? I think that was as well. Yeah. So, so old scout bourbon, the old scout bourbon that we had for several years and, and unfortunately eventually ran out of, we just ran out of stocks. That's being relaunched and re-released this fall uh, at the same age at which we first bottled it and the same proof at which we first bottled it. So it's five and a half years old, 99 proof. Um, and that'll that'll return to the marketplace uh, this fall. And five, that, five years. That, that's based on five years. That's based on what John was saying, the whiskey that we purchased in, in 2014. Right. I got you now. Yeah, the American whiskey that we've had for a while will, will eventually be will eventually go away. The Old Scout, the High Rye, um, Indiana will come back in a 99 proof, and we'll also have a, a little bit of a custom pick a barrel program, also as we used to do in the past uh, with that whiskey. That will return uh, later in later in the fall or early winter uh, this year as well. So on the on the source end of things, the Old Scout's coming back. Uh, on the the homemade stuff, the yeah, big level will will continue as not highly allocated, but at least partially allocated. It's not as readily available as, for example, Contradiction is, um, and it's getting a little older, you know, as as well. But that will continue uh, this year. So really, all three of the families, as we talk about them, are all going to continue to roll into into twenty twenty. Uh, the old scout bourbon's back. Contradiction continues to to grow and and be a healthy part of our our brand, and as well as the homemade stuff and big level plus gift shop stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you you mentioned the rye in there because there's a lot of diehard rye folks out. You know, you you know yeah. that you've you've got a you've got a a, a big consumer base of these. Uh, these dramblers that that love to collect and love to the bodies and and a lot of them have the those old rise that are on there. So kind of talk about what the the game plan is for that. So we first of all, contradiction is the biggest focus of what we do. We like the fact that it first of all, we think it's a delicious whiskey. It's it's now at a, at a proof that's easy and price that are easily accessible. So it used to be a hundred proof and about a fifty dollar bottle. Now it's uh, ninety two proof and it's a forty dollar bottle. And, and we, one of the reasons we like it is because it gives us the ability to scale up. In a, and we still have a small plant, even compared to some of these, whatever, mid-majors, some of these new places, right? The, the new rifts or rabbit holes of the world. Um, you know, we're, we're small compared to those guys. And so the contradiction gives us the ability to scale up. Um, we, the first thing that we will bring back is in so this, well, in a timeline sense, the first thing we'll bring back is, right, as John said, the old scout and the old scout custom barrel pick. And then in about a year from now, we will add to the Contradiction family. We already have Contradiction bourbon. We'll add Contradiction rye into the portfolio, which will be a blend of some rye made in three places of Indiana, Tennessee, and West Virginia. And we're excited about that. A lot of people I know haven't tasted rye out of Tennessee. So it is delicious. And of course, another year of aging never hurts, right? So I think it's ready to go now. Uh, but we're going to wait a year so the old scout stuff gets gets sort of settled, and then we'll bring back uh, old scout, uh, an old scout rye in the future, but in a, in a limited way as well. 
And of course, we'll bring out some of our own rye. Most people know that we that we only make weeded bourbon, but we've been making a rye based bourbon and we've been making rye whiskey for a number of years. And uh, we'll we'll start to bring that out. It's still relatively young. It's still about four years old now, a little less than four years old. And it's good, but I, I would rather, I, I'm forced, I would rather wait for, wait for everything to be seven or eight years old, but sometimes that's not financially feasible. No, absolutely. It, it, sometimes you've just got to figure out like, how can we, how can we squeeze this out just a little bit to, to buy us a little bit more time, you know? That, that's right. And, and, and we've had, you know, we've had a market in the past that's been pretty extreme, right? Bottles that are 65 to a couple hundred dollars, but the products that we'll be launching in the in the near future are mo- more about accessibility for us. So we really want to be in that you know, kind of forty to sixty dollar range. Look, I, you, you, I know you, you you joked earlier about whether or not the deal made us you know, drive Maseratis and Porsches or thing. And and the reality of it is is no. We John drives a how old is your two thousand eight Nissan Maxima, and I love it. When <laughs> it's on the side of the road, I'll cry a tear and go get another one. <laughs> we have a Ford pickup truck, right? I mean, neither one of us cashed out in the Pernod deal, right? And um, and so we we still go to work every day, just like just like we always have, and, and in fact, we're even motivated to do more than to, to do more than we ever have. Yeah, I want to I want to touch on that a little bit more here in a minute. But you also had had talked about uh, the American whiskey and, and maybe seeing the. Do you say that's going to start sunsetting as well? It, it is. Yeah. Uh, you know. I, we always thought it was really good, and in fact, there's a there's a bourbon group out there that's pretty well known, and they did some blind tastes on on it with I think 13 other whiskeys, and it came back to be in a blind score, it won all against straight bourbon. But it just doesn't. It's hard. It's a hard sell, right? If people if it doesn't say bourbon, it doesn't say straight bourbon. The store doesn't know where to put it. People aren't sure what it is. They aren't sure of the provenance from it, and so it's just. It, it's a hard sell, and so for that for that reason alone, it's going to sunset. Yeah, and part part of that reason, part of that challenge is to be quite honest. If if the handful of people that had been doing American whiskey for eight or ten years or whatever had been honest about what it was, and the groundwork had been laid for some clarity for American whiskey, I think it it certainly wouldn't unseat bourbon or be be in the same zone, but it, I think it would be more well-respected than it is. Problem was, you know, you had a, you had a handful of brands that had a quote unquote American whiskey and you didn't know where it was from or what it was. You had to, you know, it, it was just sort of this mystery. You know, I remember in high school at the cafeteria, it was mystery meat. Like it was just sort of <laughs> whiskey's like mystery whiskey. Like, well, where is it from? Well, we can't tell you. Well, what's the mash bill? Well, we can't tell you that. Uh, you know, you got to waterboard the rep to find out whether it's even chill filtered or not. The work was sort of laid out that it was a redheaded stepchild from its inception. And um, we try to be the opposite of that with our American whiskey. We try to tell everybody as much as we could about where it was from and the way that we treat it and all that kind of stuff. And sadly, because it is still in a barrel getting older, you know, the best, probably the best bottle we'll ever sell will be the last bottle. Well, I mean, I guess there's there's two sides of this, right? I I, I think you, you you kind of I'm sure it was a, a tough call to sit there and say like, yeah, like we can't we can't fight this uphill battle much longer, right? Because it, you are right. It, it with with how hot bourbon is, it's it's hard to come in and try to bring in a new category and think, yeah, like let's try to try to play this and try to capitalize on this because yeah, I mean, it's it's tough when people don't see that that just that that seven letter word right there bourbon sure. right and and so when i when i think about this um you know if you know you'd also mentioned the if the last bottle or whatever it, it also kind of gives you an opportunity here uh to say well let's just quit selling it we'll sit on these barrels for i don't know how much you know how longer and maybe the time will come around and then we can capitalize on it because once you got something that's a, a 10, 14, 18 year old product, who knows from there, it might be something that people are going to go ape shit over at some point. It's the, you're right. And that's the sad part about, first of all, that's the sad part about selling any barrel that's young. Yeah. You, you really want to say, uh, you know, look, I really want to know what this five-year-old barrel tastes like when it's 14 years old. 
but uh, it's for even for our size business, or especially for our size business, that's a big gamble, right? So we've, we've basically elected to you know to what, what little bit we have left to move all from and in essence swap that for a high rise bourbon product in, in terms of in our in our source category right we're gonna we're gonna say that hey look we know what high ride did us if we're gonna use this money let's use it to know what we you know what what were basically was the you know the thing that got us here which was the high ride old cow and and you know when that bourbon comes out this fall you and we all know somebody's gonna taste it and they're gonna say yeah you know I like it but I, I, I don't like it as much as that 14 year old cast strength single bear well, no shit. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tastes different than something that's nine years older. Yeah. Yeah. We got it. I, I think so, that's, you I know, think, I think that was part of the things that maybe you were alluding to where I chimed in when people were talking about old scout select, uh, being, you know, not being as good as 13 year old old scout select is not being as good as 13 year old MGP. Well, yeah, that's right. Right. There's a reason that one is a hundred and seventy five dollars at the gift shop and one sixty five dollars all over the all over the country. Right. It's mm-hmm. worth about thirty five percent as much as the MTP juice. And there's some and that's kind of a joke. There's some scarcity to it as well. But we also you know, we, we jumped in with that. The Tennessee stuff that we have is, uh, you know, is really a pretty for the most part. It's a one time release. It was a spot purchase. We thought it was really good juice. And so we brought that out this um uh, you know, over the spring and summer as well. I think there's, you know, we've been, you, you guys know what we've been doing too. So we know that going in and doing a Tennessee product was also going to be fighting a little bit of an uphill battle, but we also think there is the opportunity to help change some minds that are out there. Uh, you know, for the longest time, people just, and, and don't get me wrong, people thought Kentucky was God. And then all of a sudden now you've got these MGP groups and now people think MGP is God. And so it's, I think there's just going to be a circle. And at some point people are going to realize like, oh crap, there was all this high age Tennessee stuff that was available. And that was really good too. Um, And so we're going to see this where, I mean, and I'm sure that you all are kind of seeing it too, is that if you have a demand and you have a market demand for something that is nine, 10, 14, 15 years old, it's not available unless it's coming from a different state, right? None of that stuff is available anymore. And so if, if you're looking for something that has that oak, just that richness, that complexity, some of that buttery taste, like, yeah, like that's, all, you're only going to find it in one place now. That's right. That's right. You know, did, did, did it bother you when it, it came out and people said, well, you know, we just don't drink Tennessee. This did that, was that upsetting that you thought you picked a really, really good barrel. And then people say, oh, it's just whatever, because it's from Tennessee. Oh, of course. I mean, I think, like I said, there's the people have this, they have, they have a blind think or blind thought about it. Most of them say, most of them just haven't tried it. They just don't really know what a killer single barrel could be, especially at cash drink, because a lot of the Tennessee stuff that is sourced there, it's on the market. It's not cash drink. It's not a single barrel. And you don't really have that really that that background to sit there and say like oh yeah like no nope, not going to do it there's too much flintstones vitamins everywhere well yeah. you, you know one of the things that john and i laugh about quite a bit or or at least chuckle about uh and find a little bit funny which is the first time we sent old scout rye out for a really good review it was crushed seven years old 99 proof mgp rye uh, we stand alongside the 99 proof bourbon and the old scout 10. And they were all sort of the two bourbons were kind of mediocre and the rye was crushed. And I can tell you that if I had a chance to buy 10,000 barrels of old scout rye, I would leave this conversation right now and go <laughs> for no for the money because that's how much you if it was over 40,000, I'd go find the money for them. It's just it was in such high demand. And so I think you have to remember that a, a negative review or bourbons at bourbon folks who are, as you know, look, we, we call them the whiskey nerds and that's a badge of honor. That's not anything that's, that's uh, sort of, de- 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 we're trying to diminish them. Um, but they are, they are emotionally involved in the brands and they get serious about their whiskey and they have very strong opinions. And thankfully they're here because that's what grew our business. But, um, you know, there's a whole world out there that's, that bought our rye at seven years old and would still buy it if we had seven year olds. You know, I'm not a I'm not a student of of this, so I'm probably going to get the timeline completely fucked up. But it, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, the the 
MGP and now Tennessee and then little guys like us all over the U.S. I mean, the cream's going to rise to the top, whether you, and, and not just on bourbon, but um, on some of the, um, the American single malts. I mean, 50 years ago, good wine only came from a couple of places, and it wasn't California, and it wasn't Chile, and it wasn't Central Virginia. And now, go, go tell somebody in California, California can't yield good wine, right? But in the 70s, somebody in France would have told you, you're out of your mind to think that any quality wine will ever come out of California. So, I, you know, maybe that'll happen with um, maybe that'll happen with these bourbons and rise and the single malts. And and as that cream rises to the top, you know, nothing against nothing against Kentucky. We love Kentucky. We wouldn't do what we do without an affinity for what they've done with that spirit. But I think the tide will eventually turn when people more people will accept it. Yeah, you can have a kick ass uh, rye from Maine and you can have an amazing vodka from Pennsylvania, uh, you know, like. I hope that happens. I will say this. I think the difference is, right, is that in, the, in your scenario, the, like related to craft beer, when craft beer came out, the beer guys weren't making necessarily great beer and the craft beer guys were. Mm-hmm. The Kentucky distilleries aren't making bad whiskey. They're making great whiskey. And so the craft distillers have work to do. And as, our, and as this industry, as the craft distilling industry evolves and becomes more mature, the whiskey's going to get better. I know the whiskey we make today is better than the whiskey we made four years or six years ago, eight years ago. Because if you're not getting better today than you were six months ago, you should stop doing what you do and go do something else. And yeah. uh, that's that's where we feel, right? It's like, it's like Big Level. I know Big Level has a love it or hate it relationship. Um, and, and we wouldn't put it out if we weren't proud of it. But I can tell you this, the Big Level we made four years ago and two years ago and six months ago continued to get better. And it got better by a long shot because we got better. We also run a different still, right? But we got better. We got better at everything we do, selecting grains and fermentation, uh, distillation, distillation style, aging, longer aging, whatever that is. So that, that our, our goal is, as John said really early on, our goal is to be uh, really, really serious about what we've done. And, and we've taken every step. We've been obsessive about our production. So. It's all getting better. That's what that's what hurts your feelings a little bit when somebody tries something and they're just like, yeah, it's a drain pour. You know, I couldn't even drink it with I couldn't even drink it with Coke, you know, or whatever. Like, I get it. I mean, and, and just because we like it doesn't mean anybody else has to. Uh, I completely understand that. But it's it's as though you didn't think we tasted that whiskey a hundred times before we put it in a bottle. You think we just went out and blindly just chose some barrels and didn't pay any attention to how they tasted and put them. I mean, not at all. Like we panel everything and and that doesn't mean anybody's got to like it. That's okay. But to, you know, trust me, if you don't like it, that's okay. But not because we didn't like it because we don't bottle anything. We don't like. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so I guess you kind of talked about that because big level was sort of that like hit or miss with a lot of the community. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And you know, John, you had mentioned that it's even kind of getting on allocation in some states and stuff like that. So do you see big level as kind of always evolving or transforming with releases as it comes out? From forest to still, Bull Run Distillery whiskeys are using some of the best water in the U.S. They're also experimenting by aging them in different types of barrels, including cognac, Madeira, and Pinot Noir barrels. Two of their whiskeys are being featured by Rackhouse Whiskey Club in their October box. Made from 96% corn, Bull Run's American Whiskey is the lightest and sweetest product they offer and has very little barrel character to it. Accompanying that in the Rackhouse Whiskey Club box is a Pinot Noir finished whiskey. It's the same American whiskey, but finished in French oak barrels. You really have to try these two side by side to see what barrel aging can do. And you can do that by checking out Rackhouse Whiskey Club. They're a Whiskey of the Month Club on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse boxes ship out every two months to 40 states. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try these unique whiskeys. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. What defines Distillery 291 Colorado Whiskey is its spirit. Passion permeates every sip. Since day one, Distillery 291 distills from grain to barrel to bottle by hand, distinctive Colorado whiskey. Utilizing grains from the Colorado Plains and water collected from Pikes Peaks Reservoirs, 291 Colorado whiskey is handmade 
the Colorado way. Everything matters. 291 Colorado Whiskey has earned bushels of national and international awards for its spirits with the unique character and the flavor of a bygone era. Named World's Best Rye in 2018 by World Whiskey Awards, seven liquid golds from Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible, 291 Colorado Whiskey embodies the traditions of the past married with the boldness of the future. Find a bottle near you at 291coloradowhiskey.com. Ride it like you stole it, drink it like you own it. Live fast and drink responsibly. So do you see Big Level as kind of always evolving or transforming with releases as it comes out? Absolutely. Well, maybe not always evolving, but all over the short period, I think in a couple of years, it'll reach its, you know, where, where it wants to live in age and discipline and everything else. So I wouldn't say it always is going to evolve, but yeah. I mean, if the first big level you ever had was batch three and now we're on batch 50, uh, give it a shot. Yeah. I think you'd be really surprised at the change. And, you know, it's, it's not that we have this, uh, badge of honor that it's improved now over maybe the first couple of batches. That's just a natural progression of our business. As John said, you can't do something over and over and over again without getting, getting better at it. And, and I'm not ashamed of batch one big level, no matter how much anybody may or may not have liked it. Uh, we tasted it. We're in love with it. We made it with our bare hands and I'm not ashamed of it just because a later batch is better. Yeah, absolutely. And so there is something that you still talked about uh, a little talking about craft. I mean, do you really guys still consider yourself a, a craft distiller? I mean, cause you guys are pretty big now. Uh, yes, of course. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the definition of craft is anymore. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there's like a, a case question. minimum or volume or anything anymore. Yeah. I, look, I think that, you know, I'm not, I think my, first of all, I'm making a habit to never talk poorly about anybody, but um, this is not talking poorly, but I usually don't talk about other brands, but, I mean, is Buffalo Trace craft? Is Four Roses craft? Yeah. Who's making better product than some of these other brands, right? So I think that they're, they're really good at their craft, right? Um, there, there are a lot of brands like that. But if you look at it the way that we used to think of craft distilling as being some small plant, I think all of the whiskey that we have on the market right now is definitely, sorry, all of the whiskey that we made that is on the market right now is definitely craft whiskey, right? It's whiskey that was made, you know, loading bags of grain, 50 pound bags of grain in a still and turning valves by hand. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of more hands-on really handmade product, right? There's this whole definition of like, what is handmade? These were really made, really handmade. We still do a lot of hands-on stuff. But this was a lot of labor and a lot of love. And, you know, if, we, if it didn't work, John and I don't just go get other jobs. We move, you know, there's not, not a lot in West Virginia. So we're putting a lot of risk. That seems very, it seems much like a craft to me. We have certainly evolved. I don't even know what our term is now. We're not even a mid-major. Maybe we're a, I like to say that we're a large craft distillery. <laughs> so I, yeah. that's kind of the way I think about it. Um, so I, I, the, the, it's a hard term to do. We don't really use it anymore. As long as we're talking here, we don't use it in any sort of publication. I don't think we use it on our website anymore. Yeah, I mean, nobody knows what it means. And as you know, there's so much BS in the market with market fluff right now, which is, which, which is a whole other problem that we have, right? We, we don't have a market. Our marketing story is we don't have a marketing story. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, I usually refer to us as a small producer, which, I mean, you have to, we don't use the word craft a whole lot, craft distillery a whole lot. And that's the distinction, right? There's a quote unquote craft distillery. And then there is the craft of making great whiskey and, and Buffalo Trace and Heaven Hill are good at the craft of making really great whiskey. We think we are too. But sometimes you, you have to say craft distiller because other people expect you to, or you're introduced as, oh, Johnny Foster from craft distillery. But I really think of us as, as just a small, a small, small producer. That's probably a better way. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you also mentioned West Virginia. I think we kind of talked about at the top of here that, you know, that's where you all are based. Kind of talk about what, you know, over the past few years, kind of what Smooth Ambler's done for the area, uh, done for the community and stuff like that too. It's, it's interesting. We, I, uh, I missed a meeting at the CVB today. I double booked myself for a 10 a.m. <laughs> the Convention Visitors Bureau here. And one of, that's one of the things that I was going to talk about. So I wrote some notes on that for Val. So it's interesting that you, uh, Val's doing that for us. Val, who runs our tasting, tasting room. 
you know, I think, well, I know we're, we're as proud of the impact that we've made in our small community as we are of the whiskey that we put out. And at the end of the day, it, as, it, any business you want to do, you, you'd like to make someone's life better. And whether that's with you know, your podcast or the whiskey that you guys go out and source or, or, or what we do, the, the goal that you're making, that you're improving someone else's life is something that you should always take with great pride and honor. Uh, and so we, you know, we started with three employees. It was John and I, and and one other person, and we now have twenty three employees. And though they pay, we pay them way more than anything in the geographic norm. And they get free vision and dental, and it's highly subsidized medical care. And they start with uh, three weeks of paid vacation. And it doesn't seem like. Maybe that doesn't seem like the world, but we feel like we're doing a really good job. Our employees love what they do here. We treat them well. We, we just took a group of salespeople um, that had come in that were, that were visiting here. We took them whitewater rafting and got sporting clays. And so we bring some of our employees to go along with those with those things. So I think we have something that's pretty magical. Uh, when when Prano comes or when we bring these salespeople in here and we're getting hotel rooms or we're spending money at bars and restaurants or say going to shoot sporting plays or spending money at the rafting companies that in essence which is some agritourism and and the visitors right so we have dramblery and so there's gonna be 175 people from out of town that are going to come in here and stay two room nights and that's a big impact in a town of 35 people that they're gonna there's gonna be 350 room nights over two nights spent here and and that's a big impact for us or for our community and so those things we're really super proud of and and somebody, Anna, yesterday told me that uh, thank you for making me, thank you for having some, for having something for us to be proud of. And I said, what are you talking about? And she says, you know, when I go somewhere and I tell people that, oh, we have the distillery Smooth Ambler in our backyard, they go, oh, we love Smooth Ambler. And so they feel proud that they're from this little bitty town in rural West Virginia and they have something that is exported across the world and is a really good product and that people can be proud of it. That had a motivation to be better every day. Mm-hmm. And, and we've also, you know, when opportunities arise to try and raise money for good causes, uh, we've done that. I mean, we had a terrible flood here in West Virginia, as you may remember, uh, three years ago. And uh, we pulled out all the stops to raise some money for that. Um, we had a live bottle auction in Kentucky, which I think is one of the one of the only places you can do that legally anyway, uh, in, uh, in Northern Kentucky a couple of years ago, raised a bunch of money that we, what, 20 grand, Seven grand. that we, that we gave to, um, an organization called team Rubicon that deploys experienced first responders, um, usually former military personnel, uh, in disaster situations. Uh, the smooth ramblers got together and raised some money for Val, uh, so that she could start, a local dog rescue business, which is her, which is her passion. Um, we helped out a friend of ours who used to sell, used to be one of our reps with a different distributor. And we moved away from, from that uh, w- with the Perno thing, but you know, her brother was, was having some medical issues and we saw an opportunity to try and, and, and use some of our leverage to help her. It's like, we, really believe in, in giving back and doing everything that we can to help our community far and wide. Sometimes that community is here in West Virginia. And sometimes that community is anywhere we can affect some change and, and help people out. We, we, we're also right in the middle of rural West Virginia and there's not a lot of diversity here. So we're proud of the fact that there are uh, four or five members of our 23 person crew here that are in same sex relationships, right? We want to be welcoming to everyone. And we're, we, we've been really bad about not talking about those things. The money we raised for flood relief twice, uh, the, the, the other community things that we've done, the donations we've made, charities in West Virginia. We've, been, we've, been, we've done a really bad job of doing that because we felt like we were pandering to people. And we never want to feel like we're doing it just for the business. We do it because it's the damn right thing to do. That's a good way to put it. It's good to see that you all are advocating a lot of diversity because I think that's something that this industry is really lacking. Uh, and and there's a lot of push for it as well. So it's it's great to see you all being on the front lines of that too. But there was one thing that uh, you all talked about that I, I kind of want to do with you all, and, and I'm going to go whitewater rafting with the Johns. I think that'll be fun. Come on. Dude, we, we, yeah. we'd, love, we'd love to have you. We do it again in two weeks. 
Yeah. We got we yeah. got a crew from Texas coming in. You're, and I'm, I'm not kidding you. That we you know, people when people come here, they go, "Oh, this is they're amazing." I've been on 35 of these, or, or I've been on distillery trips for 35 years. It's the best we do. And I tell them, "This is what we do." For for I I, I want to tell them that we're treating them special, but the reality is, is we're not. We just treat them like we would treat our friends if we had the money personally to go do those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's kind of what we do. You know, not, not talking. Uh, not talking about any other specific brand, but I, we, one of the reps told us when they were here, like, you know, we go on the trips and sometimes it's overseas and sometimes it's here, whatever. And um, he, the, he was just, he's like, I, I really appreciate the time that you and John uh, spent with us, you know, because normally we, we go and we get, if, if there's a founder, some of those big brands, you know, the founders have been dead for a long, long time, but if they're around, you know, he was like, they might come down from their mansion in their Maserati for a little while. And like, hang out with you at a dinner and then leave. He, he's like, you and John are like driving us around and cooking burgers. And like, you know, we don't, we never experienced that before. We just, we treat everybody like, like family here because it, well, I'll tell you this for a real reason, but I like shooting sporting plays and I like, <laughs> and I like going whitewater rafting. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's not laying bricks. It's I not mean, laying yeah, bricks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not digging ditches for yeah. it. And let's consider how lucky we are. But it's also not a, it's also not just a marketing tool. I mean, it's who, it's who we are. It's how, it's how we roll. So it comes very naturally. And, and again, at the, at the end of the day, it's like, well, what, what can we do that, that maybe somebody else can or won't do? And, it, you know, we can buy, we can buy 10 million smooth ambler cocktail shakers and we can carpet bomb all of our significant markets with those. Um, but that's something that's really easy for somebody else uh, to do and, and very common for somebody else to do. We, we just try and always, when we can put a, put a personal touch on things. Yeah. Just have a good party at the Johns and hopefully get a good trip advisor review after it. Well, and that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, if we drive your ass around five stars, five stars, um, but you know, that's how's your Uber rating, John. Terrible. <laughs> but you know, that's what, that's what the, the whiskey wagon is all about. I mean, that, that oh, yeah. the whole impetus for that whole idea is, Let's take, you know, the way we would treat somebody in my backyard or over at John's house or here at the distillery uh, on the road. And that is turn up the music and lay out some whiskey and put out the cornhole. I mean, that's that's not just a marketing affectation. Hey, we think this is a good idea to sell some whiskey. I mean, I sure should hope it sells some whiskey because that's what my job is. But it's also who we are. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah, talk about that for a second, too, because I remember seeing pictures of the Whiskey Wagon, but for our, our listeners who may not have heard of it, go ahead and kind of explain what it is. So it's a it's a mobile tasting room, in essence. Uh, you know, we, we saw a lot of those wagons that people pulled around these Airstreams, and they were more like food trucks, right? So bartender sits inside, customer's outside, you serve to the customer, and uh, they they leave. The Whiskey Wagon is a, is a box trailer, a big box trailer that called a stage trailer and the doors, the sides of the trailer open up and become floors. It comes pretty big when you open it up. It's about 31 feet long by 16 feet once open. And it has a guardrail around it. And so the idea is that people come up into the vessel and hang out. So it's just like, well, it's as much like our tasting room as a box trailer can be. So it's red walls, which are in our trailer, which are in our tasting room rather. Uh, It's real cabinetry, real bar, uh, you know, a sink that people can work in, two coolers so we can keep stuff for cocktails or bottles of water in there, speakers, air conditioning. It's 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 amazing. And the reception has been amazing. Uh, we, we're we're doing crazy numbers. We go to these festivals, these beer, bourbon and barbecue festivals and and showcase there. We're going to one in Knox. It, it's on the way to Knoxville right now. John leaves here in one hour and goes to Knoxville this weekend. Uh, and And we'll have. 1,200 to 1,800 people visit it during a six-hour span. It's absolutely getting crushed, and we we love that. You know, that's our downfall. One of the I mean, first of all, Kentucky makes a lot of great whiskey, as I alluded to earlier, but it also has a really good location. In other places that people come to, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. So if you're here, you've made a you've made a real effort to get here. If you can't come to us, we're going to come to you, and that's what the whiskey wagon's purpose is. It's basically like a you see one of the, some of the Transformers movies, <laughs> yeah. like a Transformer. If they were like a redneck Transformer that like Hank Williams Jr. and whiskey a lot, <laughs> that's what this thing is. That sounds, that sounds pretty awesome. I'm on Perfect. board with that. Yeah. Perfect. 
<laughs> so we're going to kind of uh, start wrapping it up real quick, but I, I you know, we, we talked about the Perno deal a, a little bit and I'm sure, not sure you get into the specifics, but kind of talk about really what more of the, the benefits did it really drive uh, for you all? Um, is there kind of like a sense of relief a little bit that, you know, it's not completely just bootstrapped on you anymore. Like kind of talk about what that means to you all. Certainly from a financial standpoint, there's a sense of relief, right? As I, as I talked about earlier, you know, if this didn't work, John and I move. Well, now we have a little bit more financial security. Certainly the business does, right? It has some more financial security. They, they, they've been really wonderful to us. But that doesn't mean it's been, it's always been, right? It's always been wonderful, smooth sailing. It's, it, it's you know, it's integrating a small business into a, a corporate situation is not always easy. But as a friend told me, a friend who'd been in the business a very long time, a former master distiller, told me that they were as much like a family business as a corporation can be. And I believe that to be true. The things that they help us with are endless. You're talking about the ability to access everyone from IDL, uh, Irish distillers, to folks at Hiram Walker about production details, everything from grain receipt to bottling. They know about it. They've been through it. They, they, and, and we actually send samples here three times a week to them and they test them on some other equipment that we don't have, which is a really wonderful thing to have from a production standpoint. So we're better by a long shot than the way we used to be because of that. And because we now have a, an operations manager because we can afford to have those things. Uh, we're better at our legal stuff by a long shot because they have a legal team and by uh, human resources and helping us to put together these uh, wonderful manuals and diversity policies and and help us to not just to put them together, but to live them even better. So the whole Perno deal for us has been absolutely wonderful. From the sales side, they have a really large distribution footprint and they have a ton of help in there. Our our job is is to find out how a small business is financially or strategically significant to their distrib- distribution partners or or to them as well. And so that's what that's what our task is. Our our job is to find our place and then to grow that to become more important in their system. And 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 that that that's the challenge. But that's not unique to Pernod. The when I say there's not smooth sailing, it's not unique because there's Pernod. Pernod's wonderful. That's the that's the the issue that any small business faces when they try to go, when they try to grow and they try to get bigger. And 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 the bigger is not just about money for us. The bigger again is about opportunity. We want to share the whiskey with more people. We want our employees to have better lives and we want them to you know, go on vacation more often and have nice cars and whatever that is that makes people happy in the world. And so all of that comes with, with a deal. And when you first started, I know you didn't mean it, but when you say we got bought out, we like to, th- and it is, I guess that's one of the terms, but we like to think of it as a buy-in, right? They, they own the majority of the business, but they don't own all of it. And, and uh, we, we are partners with them still. So that's, that's kind of the way we think of our business. It's sort of, you know, whenever those acquisitions take place, particularly in the in the craft beer world, I mean, those guys are, man, they're severe when their favorite brewery gets uh, bought out by AB or one of these bigger companies. But the but even I think in the whiskey world, the the for people like us, the temptation is to think, oh, well, you know, so now they're going to start, they're going to fit me and John with mind control chips. And uh, you probably need one. I probably need one. Um or start forcing stuff down our throat and, uh, you know, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I can tell you, and I'm sure John agrees with me from the production standpoint, but certainly from the sales and marketing standpoint, uh, it, it's been like the opposite of the movie Field of Dreams. Instead of build it and they will come, they have been very much like we come to them with a good idea and they'll help us build it. And I don't know what else you can ask for from a corporate partner beyond that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess John or Foster, should I say, I got to, I got to make sure I say this right. Cause you'll probably be like, huh, what, who's this directed to? But uh, so Foster, you know, little said something about like how they helped you with distribution. I mean, that was kind of like been, that was kind of like your deal for a while. Right. I mean, how, how has that like kind of really benefited you? Well, uh, I mean, th- their network is vast and varied. And uh, so it's a little bit of a challenge to, because the relationships that they have inside of their distributors uh, can work a couple of different ways. And um, that that's a, has been a difficult navigation, just understanding it and understanding what's important 
to each sort of layer uh, in that relationship. But sometimes you have teams that are completely dedicated to Pernod products. Sometimes you have uh, teams that are full book. Sometimes you have both. Sometimes you have combinations of both. And um, I think, as John said, that uh, that layer and understanding how to drill deep into those things. And as John says, and we've said for years, to, to figure out how to become strategically or financially important to, to those reps, everybody's got that problem. That's not a, per, I'm not picking on Pernod when I say that that's been a bit of a challenge. That's a small business. Everybody's, everybody's got that issue because your average street rep at, at, a, at a distributor or, or your average manager or your average manager, even inside of Pernod, they have some big brands that they're really responsible for making sure uh, continue to be healthy. And so the challenge for all of the small producers like us is how to live in that world and navigate those waters in a way that produce results. And the, when we say strategic or financial, the two ways that that can happen is um, you, you use a small uh, esoteric brand to, to, as leverage to kind of get in the door or get in front of a buyer or get in front of a buying group that you might otherwise you know, have trouble getting uh, into with one of the commodity uh, items. Or the other thing is to really start to see some critical mass in sales. I mean, man, I can tell you as somebody who was in sales for a long, long time, 100% commission, when, when your brand starts to show up on somebody's commission report, they start to pay attention. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and that's the most powerful thing we can try and do, really. Oh, that's fantastic. So let's go ahead and we'll kind of wrap this up because there's always one thing that if you'd listen back on episode 79, I know I had asked it when we talked to, to John Little, but kind of for our newer listeners, tell them where the name Smooth Ambler comes from. Uh, Smooth, Smooth Ambler is, uh, an amble is a gate. Uh, a, a, a horse is typically born with a gate called an amble. Uh, and it is between a walk and a run. And that spoke to us about the area in which we live. It's people think we're a bunch of, maybe a lot of people think maybe we're a bunch of, you know, a bunch of country folks. Um, and we're certainly not New York city. We know that, right. But we, we live in this really wonderful place in West Virginia in this really wonderful community, Greenbrier County in Lewisburg, West Virginia. And it's just got a really nice pace of life. It's, it's an amble. And we like to think that that's the same way we run our business and we hope the same way that our whiskey tastes. And so that's where, that's where smooth amber came from. There we go. Well, Johns, thank you once again for, for coming back on the show. It was good to kind of get this, this catch up of what's been going on with you because there's been a lot of changes to, to really kind of follow along and, and get those updates and hell, maybe in a year we'll do it again. Man, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Are you going to, you going to be at, at uh, hometown rising in bourbon and beyond, I guess, or no? I will be there at Bourbon and Beyond. Sure will. Okay. We'll, we'll see you there. Thanks, thanks for what you do. You got it. Um, and also want to give an a opportunity to plug if people want to come visit you. I mean, of course, you can probably pull it up on, on Google Maps, but kind of give a, a shout out to how they can learn more about you and, and where they can find you. Uh, it's just uh, smoothambler.com. It's uh, facebook.com slash smoothambler and on Instagram at smoothambler. We're getting ready to turn up all those things. Uh, and, and really work on a digital marketing campaign. So hopefully uh, people will have less, less uh, work to find what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Perfect. So make sure you follow those guys. Follow us, Bourbon Pursuit, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you like what you hear, you want to be a part of these podcasts, you want to help support us, write, either write a review or you can do it financially through patreon.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And if you have any other show suggestions, ideas, people you want to hear from, like these great guys, send us an email, team at bourbonpursuit.com. So, Johns, thank you once again for joining, and we'll see everybody next week.